really well, which is nice. The last exam is going to be in class. It's going to be during the exam week whenever the university puts that schedule out. I don't know if it's out yet. But is it? Anybody know? I don't think. Is it out? Do you know what day of the week we have our exam? Find out. Okay. <laughs> and let me know to make sure I'm here. Um, we're going to do chapter 10 today. And um, this may be the last chapter that we do. It depends. Um, this is pretty involved. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, as I said in the beginning of this course, statistics continues to build and build and build and build. And, uh, and while none of it's nothing you can't do, it just makes you go blind sometimes. I mean, looking at the way, the, the steps that you have to go through to calculate something. And this chapter <laughs> is pretty amazing. I mean, uh, in terms of the depth and the complexity. So what we've done so far, right, in the last couple of chapters, is we've talked about how to do uh, hypothesis significance testing, right? And then we talked about how to do a hypothesis test <coughs> with one variable. And that would be that example that we did of the alcoholics in that treatment program. You know, how, did, how many sick days did they take, you know, one, one group compared to the population. And then we did uh, two uh, a hypothesis tests with two samples, which was the last chapter. This chapter is the hypothesis test involving more than two. Not, it doesn't have to be three. It can be three or four, but more than two uh, samples. Okay? And it gets pretty deep. So I've read this chapter many times in my life. I reread it again over the weekend a few times, trying to think, what's, how can I explain this to you in a way that narcolepsy won't sit in? You know what narcolepsy is? That's when you fall asleep at your desk. <laughs> how can I explain this to you so that you'll grab it and, uh, and pay attention to it? Because it's hard. And um, it's, it's hard because it's so tedious. But I couldn't figure out a way to make it interesting. So we're just going to jump in and do what I always do, which is to, to teach it straight up to you. On the first page of chapter 10, which is on page 247, um, down in the bottom it says using statistics, right? Um, and in this little paragraph here explains what we're about to do in this chapter. But I think the examples are a little bit helpful in terms of um, why we would use something called a, an analysis of variance, by the way, which is abbreviated as ANOVA. It's really very popular. When you read articles for your classes, you often will see this uh, you know, reported. It's a statistic. Analysis of variance. And um, it's a very important thing to understand. It's actually not as important for you to learn how to calculate it, but we're in a statistics class, so I have to do that. What's really important for you is to understand what the number means. What does analysis of variance mean? So let's take a look at a couple of at these three examples that your author gives you, right? Number one, a researcher is examining the differences in support for the death penalty among people from different religious affiliations. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. If there are significant differences in the random samples of Protestants, Catholics, and other religions, right? So in this particular example, he's got three populations, Protestant, Catholic, and other, OK? And he's going to pull a sample from each of those populations. And he's going to see if those samples vary significantly across the three samples. But just like with the other hypotheses, uh, hypothesis testing that we've been doing, what we really want to know is, is the difference between the samples large enough that we can presume that the difference in the populations from which they were drawn is real? OK? I hope it's OK. If it's not, please let me know. The next example, 
And this uh, a random sample of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors from a large university are going to be compared on their different political views and religious values. So in this particular group, there are four populations involved. And sam a sample will be pulled, one sample will be pulled from each population, right? It's freshmen, uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And we want to see if there's a difference that's big enough across those groups to, to know or to presume with a certain level of confidence that the populations from which they were drawn really is different, okay? The third one has to, uh, a third example is bullying. Is it more of a problem in suburban, city, or rural schools, right? And so we're going to pull a sample from the suburban schools and a sample from the city schools and a sample from the rural schools, and we're going to see if there is more or less bullying in those three different areas, right? By the way, when we're talking about these things, you should try to make sure you really understand what the dependent variable is and what the independent variable is, right? So in that last example, the dependent variable is the rate of bullying or the amount of bullying, right? And the independent variables there would be uh, whether it was rural, suburban, or urban schools, right? So on the next page, your author introduces that acronym, that little abbreviation, that's what an acronym is, right? Uh, analysis of variance, which again is one of the most commonly reported statistics in science. Now he goes on in there to explain to you in those next few paragraphs what I just said to you. So I'm not going to read that, but I do want to read the last paragraph of that top of that page because it's an example that we're going to work through now, right? It's the paragraph that says, suppose that we administered a scale that measures support for capital punishment at an interval ratio level to a randomly selected sample and we divided the sample into four age groups. Let's refresh our memory here, okay? We say that we're, we gave the people a scale to measure their level of support for capital punishment. And that scale is, is, provides an interval ratio measure. I've said this in every class, I'm gonna keep saying it, right? Why is it at the interval ratio level? Because we need the variable to be measured at that level of measurement in order to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, et cetera, et cetera, okay? That's why the level of measurement is so important. In addition to that, he pulled a sample of people from a population, but then broke them down into classes, 18 to 19, 18 to 29, 30 to 45, 46 to 64, and 65 and older. That's from way back on the previous chapter, right? When we created class intervals, you remember that phrase? When we created class intervals, that's what's happening here right now, okay? So let's work through the example, because I, I think this example is a, a good example, even though it's maybe not as interesting as we would like, but it's a good example, all right? So, by the way, in the first, let me just read that first paragraph under the logic of the analysis of variance. The logic, this is what's so hard about statistics, the logic and the concept. So it says, for ANOVA, which stands for the analysis of variance, the null hypothesis is that from the population, the, for the populations from which the samples are drawn, they all have the same mean score on the dependent variable. So he writes in there the same mean score. So the null hypothesis would be stated as the mean from 1 equals the mean from 2 equals the mean from three and so on, right? That there's no difference between any of the means of the populations, in this particular case, of the different age groups. Age group 18 to 29 has the same mean as age group 30 to 45, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's the null. 
And by the way, if you had seven categories, it would keep going on, right? That little subscript indicates what the categories that we're working with. And he writes that formula, or that little picture there, on page 248. Okay, so the second paragraph goes on to say that the null hypothesis of no difference in population, if it's true that there's no difference, then any mean calculated from a randomly selected sample should be roughly equal in the average score for each of the other age groups. Make sure you understand his words, what he's saying, right? If this is true, then any sample that I picked for the 18 to 29 group or the 30 to 30 or 30 to 45 group and so on, right? Any sample that I picked would have a mean that's about the same as any other group, right? When we're doing our significance testing and our, our finding our critical areas, et cetera, what we're really trying to find is that sample that is, is an oddball sample. It's a rare sample. It would be hard to pull a sample like that, right? And that is what we use to either accept or reject the null hypothesis. We're kind of working in reverse. We never really test, as I've said to you many times, we never really test the hypothesis. We always work on testing the null hypothesis. That's why in science, they, they always say, in any science, we can't really say that we've, we found the truth, right? What we can keep saying is that we've rejected the null, okay? So let me read that again. If the null hypothesis of no difference in the population is true, then any means calculated from randomly selected samples should be roughly equal in value. That's a really important sentence, okay? The average score for the 18 to 29 year olds should be about the same as the average score for any other age group if the null hypothesis is true. Years ago when I first read this, by the way, I kept reading, uh, not this particular book, but I had to keep thinking about that and about what he was really saying, or, or whatever book I was reading, whatever the author was really saying. It says, note that the averages are unlikely to be exactly the same, even if the null hypothesis is true, right? Even if there really is no difference, when we pull a sample, the averages aren't going to be identical because we've talked about this in the past. When we pull a probability sample or a random sample, there's always going to be some slight variation. We're never going to pull two samples that are identical. I shouldn't say never. We're going to very rarely pull one that would be identical. So the last sentence, again, another important sentence, which he has in quotes, he says, rather we are asking, are the differences between the samples large enough, the difference, we pulled some samples, we see some differences between the samples, are those differences large enough to say that they are significant? And if they are large enough to be significant, we reject the null hypothesis that says, the populations are not different. And we conclude that they really are different because our samples, the differences between our samples was so big that it allowed us to conclude that the difference is really significant. So the example, by the way, gets, a, I think, a little clearer. It makes things a little clearer. Consider what kinds of outcomes we might encounter if we actually administered the scale, the support for capital punishment scale, and organize the scores by age. Let's look at the top of page 249, tables uh, 10.1 and 10.2, okay? So in table 10.1, if you look across, the, there are the four age categories, and if you look at the mean that people took this uh, survey, right, and they got an average score on whether they support capital punishment or not, the, the mean for the age group of 18 to 29 is 
The mean for the age group of 30 to 45 is 11. The mean for the age group of 46 to 64 is 10.1. And 65 and over is 9.9. .9. By the way, those are all pretty close. It looks like there's no difference there. Similarly, under the mean, the author is reporting the standard deviation for this little fictitious example. And for the first category, 18 to 29, you see it's 2.4. 30 to 45, it's 1.9. 46 to 64, it's 2.2. And over 65 is 1.7. By the way, those, that's a low standard deviation. What does that mean? Now we have to really dust our brain off. Right? What does that mean when the standard deviation numbers are small? What does it mean when they're big? The standard, I'm sorry, who said something? You or you? You? I was going to say that when they're small, that means that um, they're closer together. It means the scores are closer together, right? When, remember that ambulance example from the beginning of, of the semester, right? The response time? So when the standard deviations are small, the curve looks more like this. Right? And when the standard deviations are big, it's going to be more spread out. Right? When the standard deviation is small, you know what we say? You, uh, do you remember what we said? We, when they're small, we say there is less dispersion, meaning that the scores are more, much more clustered around the mean. Less dispersion means less spread out. When the standard deviation is big, we say that there is a lot more variation or the spread is bigger, right? Another two other words that we used way back when, and your author uses, when, um, when the, scores, the standard deviation score is small and things are more clustered, the distribution is more homogeneous. And when things are, when standard deviation is big, the distribution is more heterogeneous, right? All has to do with variation, dispersion, homogeneity, heterogeneity, whatever words you want to use. But these concepts are all the same. They all depict the same thing, right? So if the standard deviation was small, we'd say um, there's not, with, within each category, Within the 18 to 29 age group, there's not a lot of variation. The, the scores are pretty clustered on that uh, capital punishment survey. If I'm losing anybody, let me know, okay? In the 30 to 45 age group, it's even smaller, the standard deviation, 1.9, which means that that little subset, there's not a lot of big spread there either. They're all pretty close to the mean and so on, and it goes across, and you can see 65 and over is 1.7, and 46 to 64 is 2.2. So we don't have a lot of, of variation between each category, important word, by the way, for this chapter, between. <laughs> we don't have a lot of variation between the categories, and we don't have a lot of variation within each category. By the way, this word variation is also important, because what are we talking about? the analysis of variance, variation, right? So we're looking at, hey, uh, is there variation or variance between the categories? And is there variance or variation within the categories? Two, two types of variation that we're looking at, two types of variance. Look at table 10.2, again, a fictitious example. And this uh, has the age groups again. And we see that if we look across the mean for each age group, they look pretty different, don't they? The average uh, on the scale for people 65 and over, um, the average, would, they got a 22 as compared to the young people who got a 10. So it looks like older people, like me, like we like to kill people more, which is true, I do. <laughs> what next? Oh, no, and there would be more. Right. Would it be more what? Uh, spread. No, we're not talking about spread yet, oh, this, spread. right? We're going to talk about spread in a moment. Right now, I'm just talking about between the categories, right? So in a way, you're right. I mean, we're talking about the spread 
across all of the means, right? Right? So we're, we're looking, hey, this mean that we're reporting, 10, 13, 16, and 22, those are the means for each category. And are those differences between the means of each category big enough so that we could say the difference is significant and the population that each one of those groups was drawn from really is different from each of the others. Right, that's where we're going with this. With regard to Max's comment on, on uh, variation, let's look at that, like, by the way, we looked between, now we're gonna look within, right? Within each category. So within the category of people who are 18 to 29, the standard deviation is 2.4. Within the category of people who are 30 to 45, it's 1.9. They're identical standard deviations to the one above, right? So what we're saying is, you know what? Within each category, the, score, the scores are remarkably clustered within each category. But across the categories, right, the, the means are pretty different. Just think logically for a minute. If the standard deviations were large within each category, right, that means the scores would be all over the place within each category. Is that clear? The scores would be all over the place within each category. And it would be harder to interpret those mean differences, the differences of the means. It'd be harder to interpret those as really being different because the difference could be a function of how spread out the scores are within each category. So if the standard deviations within each category are the same and they're small, but the mean is different for each category, that starts to catch our eye and we say, hey, you know, there really could be differences here between each category. By the way, I'm going to tell you again, I mean, these things that we're talking about here, you could punch them out, especially you young guys, men and women who know how to use computers, you could point and click with a computer program and get the analysis of variance like that, but you would not understand what it's doing. And the whole point, I think, for us is to understand what is going on with the analysis of variance so that when you see the number, you understand what's going on because a computer isn't going to tell you, hey, I just looked at the categories of going across and I looked at each one in the middle and I calculated the analysis of variance and look what I got. That's not as powerful as doing the, the, this by hand as what I always say to you. And, and that's what's really important. You could learn the computer end of this, because your author mentions it a few times, SPSS at the end of each chapter, he gives you some exercises which we don't do. But you could, you could all learn the computer end of this, I'll bet you, within an hour, and print this stuff out. But I, don't, I would also argue you wouldn't understand the depth of what we need to understand about what number you just produced. So let's, let's take a look again at, at what the author is talking about here. So you see those two tables, right? So I'm going to go down to the, to the bottom of page uh, 248 just to get a little bit of a running start, that last paragraph. It says, in the first <coughs> set of hypothetical results, table 10.1, we see that the mean and the standard deviations are all quite similar. That's what we just said, okay? The average scores are about the same, and all four groups exhibit just about the same level of dispersion. In other words, the standard deviations are the same. These results would be consistent with the null hypothesis of no difference between the populations. In other words, if table number one, if that was our sample finding, or those were our sample findings, in table number one, it looks like we could conclude that the population from which each of those categories was pulled really would be similar. There's no difference. The last sentence of that paragraph, again, an important sentence, neither the average score nor the dispersion of the scores varies in any important way by age group. There's that word vary, variance, dispersion, right? 
Now consider another set of results, that's table 10.2, okay? Here you see substantial differences in the average score with the youngest age group showing the least support and the oldest showing the, mo the most support. Also, the standard deviations are low and they're similar from category to category, indicating that there's not much variation within each age group. Not much variation within each category is what I would say. Table 10.2 shows marked differences between the age groups combined with homogeneity or low standard deviations within each age group, which is what we discussed a moment ago before we read this. In other words, the age groups are different from each other and the variation within each age group is low. These results would contradict the null hypothesis and support the idea or the notion that the death penalty does really vary from population <coughs> to population. Now this last paragraph kind of sums up the previous page, but you wouldn't understand the last paragraph unless you really understood the previous page or two, okay? Analysis of variance, ANOVA, proceeds by making the kinds of comparisons outlined above. This test, the ANOVA test, the analysis of variance, this statistic, compares the amount of variation between the categories and with the amount of variation within the categories. So this calculation, when, it's, when analysis of variance is being calculated, it's taking into account the amount of variation across the categories and comparing that variation to the amount of variation within each category. That's what's going on here. So there are two, two subsets of variance that we have to be concerned with. The greater the difference between the categories relative to the differences within the categories, the more likely that the null hypothesis of no difference can be rejected. So when standard deviations are low within each category, right, and the differences across the categories is large, it's very likely that the differences are significant. And if they are significant, we can reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference and accept the hypothesis that there is a difference between the age groups in this particular example with regard to support for capital punishment. This is, by the way, the logic underlying the formulas that we're going to talk about either today or whenever we talk about them, right? Uh, this is the logic that's so important to understand before you even get to the formulas, which are, you know, as I said earlier, pretty deep. So now at the bottom of page 249, uh, the computation of ANOVA, analysis of variance, right? Even though we have been thinking of ANOVA as a test for the significance of the difference between sample means, right? We're testing for the differences of the, of the differences related to the mean of each category. That's what we're testing for, right? But your author points out, even though we're testing for the difference between sample means, the computational routine involves developing two separate estimates of the population variance. So we're interested in knowing if the means are significantly different. But in order to know that, we have to know two things. We have to know something about the magnitude of the difference between the means in each category. And we also have to know about the dispersion or the variation within each category. And we're going to be calculating the variance. And remember the, from that earlier chapter that we did, right? The variance, you calculated that in that column when, you, uh, when I gave you scores and I said calculate the standard deviation and you, had, you calculated the mean for the scores and then you subtracted the, uh, uh, the score minus the mean and you got some positive and negative numbers which we didn't like, so we squared that difference, right? And then we added that up and we divided by n and we came up with the variance and then we had to take the square root of that number in order to know the standard deviation. I hope you remember that. If you don't, um, you can go back and review that in, I think it's chapter four. Yeah, chapter four. 
in your book. But now in this procedure, we're going to be working with the variance. We're not going to actually take the square root of it anymore right now. For the analysis of variance, ANOVA, we work with the variance, not the standard deviation. And while we're working with the, with the variance, we're considering the variance in two ways. We're interested in the variance between the categories, how big is that? And the variance within each category, how big is that? How big, I should say, how big or small is the variance between the categories? Or how big or small is the variance within each category? Right? So there are two separate estimates that have to be calculated. He says, by the way, what I just, something similar to what I just said in this paragraph, he says, recall, it is chapter four. How about that? <laughs> Must have been uh, something I read and remembered somewhere in my mind. Recall from chapter four that the variance is the standard deviation squared, right? One estimate of population variance is based on the amount of variation within the categories of the independent variables. And the other is based on the amount of variation between the categories. That's a really important paragraph there. Now, we start to um, wade our way into some really complicated stuff here. Um, so you really got to kind of just stay with it and be committed to working through it. On page 250, a new term is introduced to you. It's SST, or the total sum of the squares. The total sum of the squares. Your author says, by the way, before constructing these estimates, what estimates is he talking about? He's saying before we construct these estimates, the estimates that he's talking about is the estimate of the variances of the variance between the categories and the estimate of the variance within each category. Okay? Before you construct those estimates, he says, I have to introduce you to some new statistical concepts, just what we needed, right? The first new concept is the total variation of all the scores, which is measured by the total sum of the squares. So the first thing he's going to do, right, is take all of the scores that are being reported to us and calculate a statistic called SST, the total sum of the squares. There's a formula in your book that's important for you to understand, right? The total sum of the squares, SST, equals I'll write it on the board here. All right, so let's take, by the way, this may be helpful. This may be helpful. Take a look at page 252 at the bottom of the page, table 10.3. We're going to kind of flip back and forth here. In this particular example, we have the age groups of 18 to 29, 30. You see that? Just like we're, we're working with there, right? He's got the scores for one, two, three, four. There are four people. He has a, just as an example, there are four people. Four. We would never work with a sample of four people. That's too small. But this is just for illustration, right? So as you can see, the, the score for the first person is seven. I'm going from the top down, eight, 10, and 15. And then there's a column right next to that, which is the score squared, OK? The score squared. 
So let's let's take a look at the, uh, back again at page two fifty. Okay. This next part of the text explains formula ten point one, which is the formula for the total sum of the squares. Okay. To solve this formula, first, this is really important. These paragraphs are really important here. To solve the, this formula, first find the sum of the squares, scores. In other words, square each score. By the way, that's what we did in that little column I showed you in table 10.3, right? In other words, square each score and then add up the squared scores. That's what this means. Okay. Next, square the mean of all the scores and multiply that value by the total number of cases in the sample, which is n, and subtract that quantity from the sum of the squares. All right? It's not hard. It's like a road map. Right? Speaking of road maps, did anybody get caught in that detour out there this morning? on the road coming into Pembroke? I did. I don't know where the heck I was going, Dakota. I could have ended up in South Carolina or something. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's turn back to um, page 252 and take a look, OK? I'm, I'm looking in the middle of the page where it says SST. Okay, yes. Could you repeat what the, they mean again? The top right. What, what, what means? The top right corner. Sure, well, well absolutely. What, what that means is the sum of each score squared minus the total number, n, times the mean of the whole group squared. We'll talk about that right now, actually, and uh, see if we can make that even clearer. So I'm in the middle of the page on page 252, where it says SST equals the sum of the x squared subscript i minus n, the formula that I wrote up there, right? And, and if we look at table 10.3, we can actually see the numbers. And I think that's helpful. So the second line of these calculations, the, the total sum of the squares, right? you see equals 438, which is the total of the x squared column for the 18 to 29 group. Stay with me now. If you're, if you're not, let me know, right? Plus 702, which is the total of the x squared column. I'm looking at page, I'm looking at table 10.3, right? That's the x squared column, 702, plus 1058, which is the total of the x squared column for the 46 to 64 age group, plus 1,994, which is the total of the x squared column for the 65 and over age group. You see how we plug those numbers in up there? In that second line of the calculations on the middle of page 252, if you don't see it, raise your hand. See these numbers here? See that's 438? That's the x squared column plus 702. That's the x squared column for the second group plus the 19, I'm sorry, 1058, which is the x squared column for this group plus 1994, which is the x squared column for this group. So he's, for each category, you got to add them all up because we're doing the total sum of the squares right now. That's what this is the total sum of the squares, right? So we add up each one of those, and then we subtract, and, and if you're looking at the numbers in the middle of page 252, we subtract n minus the mean squared. So n in this little table, right, over here, is uh, 16, because it's 4, 4, 4, and 4, Four people in each group, in other words, right? Are we okay with that? So n is 16 for this little table, 
times the mean for the whole shooting match, okay? So he calculated the mean by adding up the, the x columns, right? And then dividing by 16. And if you look at the bottom of, of table 10.3, you'll see x bar, the mean is 15.25. Do you see that, right? By the way, that's called the grand mean often, right? That's the mean of all the numbers in this table, okay? In order to get the grand mean, all he did was he took all the scores, added them together, and divided by 16, right? So he had to do that to get this number. We had to count up how many scores we have or that we're working with to get n, that's the easiest one, right? And then we had to have the, take the x squared columns, the sum of them. So that's why we have four of them, because we've got four categories in this example. That's where we got these numbers. So you see, if you take it slow, slowly, you will see that this isn't really hard to do, but it's an organizational nightmare almost. It's easy to make a mistake, because it's easy to miss a step. <coughs> but if you slow down and you say, okay, well, what's this? And if you make your tables that look like table 10.3, you'll see that each column, you'll see the squared scores for each column. And then it's easy to plug those numbers in up on the top. I'm going to go back to the middle of the page where we're dealing with that big, ugly mess of calculations, right? And the third line in the calculations is the SST, the total sum of the squares, equals, right, 4,192, because he, he added 438, 702, 1058, and 1954, which I didn't do, but you're welcome to do, and I encourage you to do it, but you'll probably end up with 4,192, right? Minus 16, which is N, the second half of that, right? minus 16, which is n, times the mean, the grand mean, the mean for all the numbers, squared. So this would be 15.25 squared. If we keep working through the math, and you'll see it in the next section, um, the next uh, line down, excuse me, that's all the author is doing here, is showing you that the math that he's working through until he gets to the last line, which is SST equals 471.04. So the total sum of the squares for this particular example is 471.04. By flipping back and forth while you read the paragraph on page 250 on the top of the page and then keep looking at page 252 in that little section we just worked on, I think you will begin to understand what he's talking about on page 250 with regard to explaining the formula. If you don't flip back and forth, it's just going to be a, a garbled mess in one's mind. It's really important to go slowly and, and go back and forth. Okay, so that's how you calculate the total sum of the squares, or SST, which, again, takes a lot of work, a lot of steps. I'm going to go back to page 250. And I'm going to look at the paragraph in the middle of the page that begins with, to construct the two separate estimates. All right? That's the paragraph I'm going to begin with on page 250 in the middle of the page. To construct the two separate estimates of population variance, we take the total sum of the squares, SST, which we just calculated, right? And we divide the total variation into two components. So this is the total variation for all the scores. Now we're going to break this down. 
we're going to break down the total variation using two separate estimates. One is called the sum of the squares within, and the other is called the sum of the squares between. If you look at formula 10.2, you'll see what uh, uh, written in the equation what I just said. SST equals, right, the total sum of the squares equals the sum of the squares between plus the sum of the squares within. And so the sum of the squares between is going to tell us something about the amount of variance between the categories. And the sum of the squares within is going to tell us something about the variance within each category. Isn't this delightful? Believe me, I know it's hard, but I'd much rather be me than you listening to this, OK? I actually don't mind it. I know this can be awfully murky uh, at times. Now, by the way, two things. One is, I'm going to stop there for today because I have a conference call sh at uh, 9 a.m. sharp, so I want to get back to my office. Um, and we're going to pick up in the middle of page 250 um, in our next class on Wednesday. Okay? Thank you.